trying to take some time as uh, we've had quite a response with people sending in questions. Uh, a lot of good questions. Um, ones that help me, I think, be able to get good information out to patients. And obviously I can't be everywhere, but um, decent questions that I'd like to try to give as comprehensive a set of answers to as, as, as I can. So we'll start with this first one. And this is a, a pretty common question I get asked is, if you're gonna start patients on medications uh, to treat hair loss, such as finasteride or dutesteride or Rogaine or one of the other topical uh, solutions, um, am I advising that they use this for a lifetime? Well, you know, I, I like to put it better as my mentor used to always say, and obviously there is, there is something that led up to the need to use these medicines. And typically with men, it's the fact that their body is sensitive to DHT and the DHT is of course causing the problems. For women, it can be different, but as a general rule, these are meant to be medicines that if they are effective, if they're working well, we like to see you maintain that um, for as long as you're comfortable. So if we're gonna be using you know, a medical therapy either as a way to optimize a patient prior to surgery uh, or if we're going to use it in conjunction with surgery, I'll usually try to tell patients, you know, let's give it a year and see what type of response we've gotten. Make sure you're tolerating the medicine okay and there aren't any issues with that. And then let's look at the photos and then make a, you know, a, an intelligent decision about, you know, is value to you and does it make sense? So, you know, obviously, you, know, you never want to say forever, you know, if you can help it. But as a basic answer, yes, they are meant to be used as a, as a long-term medication because particularly for men, that DHD is gonna continue causing problems uh, down the road. That's the one thing we know for sure about hair loss, it is progressive. Obviously, it's a whole different story if you're a 25-year-old male versus, say, a 60-year-old male. Obviously, Maybe there's times when we can get away from not having to use the medicine, or maybe it's not as essential. Um, but a lot of it depends on the patient and their scenario. So I hope that answers that question. Next question I have here is, if, if there's someone with diffuse thinning, but they're using finasteride or dutesteride, will the shock of any nature of miniaturized hairs in between the implanted hair only be temporary. I think what you're trying to ask is if you're already on medication and you still have diffuse miniaturization and someone elects to go ahead and take you to surgery, maybe your donor hair is, is strong enough that it'll, it'll withstand the surgery. But if you've got a lot of miniaturized hair, you're likely going to get some shock loss. So the answer to the question is yes and no. Um, I think it would, it would be unreasonable or unfair to say that, oh no, I don't think you'll get much shock loss. And there's times when maybe that can be the case. But generally speaking, you know, especially depending on the size of the case, you can expect that there'll be some shock loss. In many cases, the hair will come back. But if it's really very fine and already on its way out, there's a good chance that that hair won't come back. Um, so a lot of it, I think, depends on what is the strength of the hair at the time of, of when you're doing the surgery. And we try to compensate for that by making sure that the areas that we're working in, that we're keeping it pretty dense and that we've got good enough donor hair to work with. So we're not just ending up with, you know, a whole lot of shock loss and then you get regrowth of fine hair and it doesn't really look like you've made much of a difference. So there's a lot that goes into making that decision, but uh, I hope, you know, as a, as a general answer, the, the truth is typically it's temporary, but it's, you know, largely dependent on the strength of the hair in that area to begin with. Um, this is an interesting question, more of a statement. Uh, patient says uh, they have CCCP, uh, central centrifugal scarring alopecia, and that their dermatologist uh, had them on a uh, steroid cream and uh, that the hair has started to regrow. Can I get a transplant now? Well, 
that's going from point A to point B pretty quick. Um, I think the first question I would ask if it was my patient, did the uh, dermatologist uh, confirm this with a biopsy? Are we sure we're dealing with CCCP? If it's a scarring alopecia and there's active inflammatory change, then no, you should not do a transplant. Um, yes, a topical steroid in some cases can help reduce some of that inflammation, but that's not a green light to go right ahead and you know jump into doing surgery. I know everybody that I see and, and most of the patients we come across, everybody's very, you know, obviously they want their hair back. Let's be, be honest, everyone wants their hair back. And many people are willing to do just about anything. But I still think, you know, taking your time and making sure you're, you're being guided properly uh, is essential. And most good dermatologists will know, and if not, you can visit, obviously, any you know, reasonable, uh, well-trained uh, ABHRS diplomat uh, surgeon or anyone that you know, is an individual surgeon who does nothing but hair and really understands the art of hair. Um, they'd be able to give you good advice about what to do and what not to do. But typically not a good idea to go transplanting into any area that has scarring alopecia. Uh, there's very few exceptions to that. Um, there are some, but as a general rule, we try to avoid that, stay away from that. This is a difficult question to answer, and I'll be honest with you right up front. A, um, a patient wrote in, I've used some strong drugs such as dutesteride, 0.5 milligrams daily, and minoxidil. Um, Topical androgens like RU58, 580R1, I think is what he's writing here, and uh, uh, Fluoridil, but never got any regrowth whatsoever. The question is why and what else can I do? Well, you know, if it sounds to me from this, this question or this statement is that you've used some, you know, some, some androgens um, maybe for what reason, that's, that's up to you. But um, you understand that you know, the more testosterone in your system, the more DHT. And to say that the finasteride and the dutesteride are absolutes and that no matter what, if you use it, you're gonna get regrowth of your hair. Unfortunately, it's just not the case. Um, I would tell you, roughly speaking, the finasteride is going to reduce your DHT levels by about 70%. The dutesteride stronger, that's usually right around 95%. But there are times when the medication gives little results. So, um, you know, that's a conversation I never like to have with patients because they always, well, what's the next step? What do we do now? You know, and as I said, there are some possible things coming down the line, but you know, we still have you know, the possibility of uh, using laser therapy and, and some other things. But I think hold tight, there are gonna be some things coming down the pipeline that are gonna be, in my opinion, very effective and uh, may give us uh, you know, another option uh, in terms of our choices and what we can do to help those areas. But uh, you know, if you're using androgens of any sort, uh, whether it be oral or injectable, you know, obviously you're not doing yourself any favors when it comes to your hair, because as your androgen levels go up, so do your DHT. Um, different oral or injectable androgens uh, are, are more uh, androgenic than others in terms of how much DHT it, it changes. So it's a good thing to understand that very well before you go getting into using that for whatever reason you're using it. Um, so I hope that answers the question. The real takeaway answer is that nothing's perfect. Um, there's been plenty of times where we've used, put patients on finasteride and, and you know, not gotten much response. It doesn't happen too often, but it does happen. And that's why usually if you've got a patient that you know, has really, really good donor hair and they're really diffusely thin everywhere, you know, it may not be, but they're all, oh, they're itching. They want to get, and they're willing to use the finasteride and they want to go to surgery tomorrow. 
you know, sometimes there can be value in, you know, giving it a little bit of time to make sure that they are going to respond to the medication. Um, because, you know, you just don't want that patient angry. You do the surgery, uh, they keep losing more hair, and then you're, you know, you're chasing your tail. So uh, I always go back to, I love the, you know, trying to optimize patients first, try to take your time. That's not what most people want to hear. It's, you know, get me well, doc, do it now and do it my way, you know. Uh, we do our best, but not every uh, one of these medicines is 100%. And, um, you know, obviously some of them have side effects that patients can't tolerate. So we do our best with it. But as I said, there are going to be some new things coming down the pipeline, and maybe we'll talk about that at, a, at another little sitting. But keep those questions coming. Um, it keeps me on my toes, and I enjoy doing it. And no question is too small. I'm happy to answer it, and I hope that I can uh, help you in your journey. Okay? Have a great day.